Every moral system says, don't lie. They all do. Why? Because societies need us to be able to trust each other. And if we're constantly lying to each other, <laughs> maybe you've noticed, we don't trust each other anymore. Nobody does. So why do, you, why do those systems say don't lie? What's the motivation behind don't lie? Well, in the, all the other systems of the world, all the moral systems of the world, it's one of two things. It's because I said so, and that's either a God or that society as a whole saying it's, it's wrong to lie. That's why. It's just wrong. Or, or maybe it's, uh, you know, they're saying, oh, well, nobody will be able to trust you and you'll have bad relationships. And so therefore it's just, you know, it's, it's expedient not to lie. You see, so either you're afraid that the boogeyman's going to get you or you're afraid you won't have any friends. That's why you don't lie in, in the world's moral systems. But those moral systems basically put the follower under the same tyranny. Behave because somebody said so. That's moral tyranny. But here's what's so great about Christianity. Christianity says, don't lie because now you're free to build somebody up instead. See, lying was who you were, but now you can be different. Why would you go back to old habits? Why would you be a slave when you don't have to be a slave anymore? You have a new identity. You're a child of God. Your father loves you so much that he was willing to give up his son and have him die so that you could be free. Why would you go back to old ways? Now, being truthful can develop a full, free, mature relationship with God. That's why you be truthful, because it helps develop that relationship with your Father in heaven. It helps develop the relationship with those around you. And there's something greater being built because you're being truthful. It's not an avoidance of punishment. Now you're building into something. You see how different the true ethics of Christianity are working out? It's not because it's wrong, even though it is. You don't do it because fullness, fullness is found in truth. That's the true ethic of Christianity. And fullness is found there because it matches Jesus Christ and the triune God. And you were built, you were created to mirror him. As an image bearer, you're supposed to reflect him fully. Well, he never lies. And so therefore, if I want to have a full relationship, if I want to be a, a mature reflector of the image of God, then I don't lie. And I become more because of that. Not only that, but because I have a full identity, I don't have to manufacture one. He's given me a full identity already. There's no pressure to achieve or make a name for myself. I don't have to lie, cheat, steal in order to get more so that I can feel like I am somebody. I already am somebody. I'm a child of the king and the verdict has already been given. He loves me. He knows me. I don't, have, I don't have to have titles. I don't have to have letters behind my name. I don't have to have a huge bank account or have achieved so many things. Be able to say, hey, look at all those things that are here because of me. I'm free to do all of those things, but I don't have to do them so that I have identity. I already have an identity. And so I'm free to do those things to honor God, not because I'm afraid of God. That's the difference. I'm not obligated to serve. I'm not striving to get a, re a reward or avoid that big boot heel that God's ready to squash me with, apparently. That's how Christianity is different in its core ethics from every other system. But look, it's important for us to, to look at this. Because if we tried to go to verse 25 and just go from verse 25 to 32 and just say, hey, this is what we're supposed to not do and do, but we didn't do time looking at this idea of putting off and renewing your mind and putting on the new self, if we didn't do that first, you're going to have a lot of trouble with all of these principles. So if you jump into verse 25 without grappling with this new condition, which is why we looked at it last week, we don't deal with that new condition that God has made in you, well then guilt and fear are still gonna be running your morality instead of the grace and the power of God. And I know many Christians that are living that way. Guilt and fear are running their life. See, most Christians I know don't fully embrace grace in their lives. They don't. They have this internal conversation that always goes back to fear and guilt. I have to do right so that God is pleased or I have to do right so that he doesn't get mad. 
This is a failure to understand grace, to struggle with it, to see how it affects every corner, every jot and tittle of your life. You've got to spend time on what it means to be in Christ. To be personally a temple of God. You can know your identity in Christ intellectually, but as his grace and his mercy and his love come cascading over you in some supernatural experience that you can't possibly explain, and hopefully you've all had one of those experiences in your life, and you experience his love and choice and grace in a completely different way, it becomes personal, not transactional. As you understand what he's done and why, it comes home. You're his child. You're sanctified. You're justified. You're adopted. All of the things that the Bible says about you. You're all of those things, but it's a process. It doesn't happen overnight. It's hard for a slave to get out of the mindset of being a slave. It takes work. It takes a change in thinking. The swish of a pen might have freed the slaves, but it has still had to change their thinking to think in a new way, to own their freedom and what it meant to be free. So this is why Paul said, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. We looked at this last week. Teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. See, I have to let the word dwell in you. And, and it's not just, to, you know, truth isn't just there to be applauded. It's there to be applied in your life. But as you apply it and transformation lives in you, look at what the result is. It's transformational. Your, your natural reaction is, ah, I got to sing. Maybe you don't do it physically. Some of, some of us just don't have that voice. But as you experience it, you find a new application for the freedom that you have. You don't live for yourself. You're living for somebody else now. And it's a joy to do it. Christian morality uses failure as much as success. You ever thought about that? Now, I'm not saying that you should fail. Please understand, nowhere in this sermon am I giving you easy believism or easy grace. None of that. This is all hard. It's hard for us to change our thinking. But failure is something that Christianity uses, not rejects. See, outside of Christianity, every system, every philosophy, every religion says, here's the way in which you have to live. So now here's what you need to do. You need to sum it up. You need to screw up your strength and, and, and just go for it. Go for this right way of living. Just be rigid and dogmatic in your pursuit of these things. But here's the thing. If you fail, God is going to be really angry with you or karma is going to come back and get you. So this is why when, when people who propose that sort of ethic and that morality, they see people fail, what do they do? Uh, lightning. Don't want to be close. Is this far enough back? They create space, don't they? This is what happens. You, you sort of inch away from this person who's failing because you don't want to be around when that squashing foot of karma comes around. And what do you say to a person that's failed if you believe in all of these other systems? <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm sure you did your best. <laughs> Good luck. So this is why morality and religion seem to always appeal to people who are already pretty good. Have you ever noticed that? Religious, really, really religious people are already pretty good. Because they don't have to worry about failure. They already have their life mostly in order. So, you know, living their life by this ethical system, well, that's easy to do. I don't do any of those things anyways. That's why we point to things that we don't have struggles with. And we say all of those things that other people struggle with, or those are the real bad things. But the thing that I do, I don't, that's not that bad. You distance yourself from sinners. But you know, Christianity actually says, those are my people. That's what Jesus did when he came. He's like, these are my people. The, the religious people rejected him. It was all the people that knew that they were sinners that, that Jesus said, yep, those are the people I want. Those are my people. First Corinthians 1 says, God chose the foolish, the lowly, the despised. Jesus says in John 15, 5, and I'm going to use it in a different way maybe than you've heard before. 
He says, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. He says, look, religious effort isn't going to make you holy enough to get into my heaven because apart from me, you're nothing. You're not something on your own and you just kind of did it a little bit better and now you're good enough for heaven. You're nothing without me. You were so far gone. You are so lost. You couldn't possibly get to me on your own strength. So stop trying to work out your own worthiness. You can't ever be worthy and start living in me because I'm the vine. And I love the lowly because they realize that they can't do it on their own. Over and over and over in the gospels, Jesus tells us this. And just because you're very disciplined or have a good background or your temperament is just right and you really can accomplish a lot in your life, that doesn't mean you're closer to God. The Bible teaches that a person with great self-control could be just as far from the kingdom of God as the person in the gutter. That's what the New Testament tells us all over the place. I mean, Jesus tells the Pharisees, the prostitutes and the tax collectors get into the kingdom of God before you because at least they know they need to repent. Don't be like the hypocrite, he says in another passage, who prays to be seen by others. The hypocrite. That's the religious person. Good religion doesn't mean a person's heart is close to God. Jesus tells the Pharisees, your morality is done for your own glory and it is a stench to God. So God comes into the lives of people who know their failures and are willing to repent. So this is what you do. You go, I came to Jesus and and then the next day I went right back to old behaviors and I go, okay, I just need to put that before God. I need to repent because I know I'm a failure. I'm not trying to earn salvation. I'm just just letting him know that I can't do this without his help. And I'm slowly changing my mindset in the whole process. So you have to know that you're a failure first. You can't be a Christian otherwise. Sorry. Sorry. Christian morals work best when failure has been the result. Now I know that I need God's grace. Look, God offers me a grace that I can't even fathom. 